Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. It's Money on Tap's insightful Summer Sector Series, diving into the hottest investing sectors for the season. Each week exploring a different high growth industry, analyzing major players, market trends, and emerging opportunities with expert guidance to make smart investments all summer long. Today on Money on Tap, the building blocks of the economy, the materials sector. Your summer school session starts now. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. My name is Seth Pressman. I'm here with Ben Brayshaw and Dan Mickelin. Good to see you guys. How are you? I'm doing good, Seth. I'm doing good. It's nice to be here again today with you and Dan and uh, just generally happy always to be on the radio with you guys. And I think I I love our conversations. I love how we break down sometimes the most boring, complex subjects. And and I actually walk away saying, well, that was a lot more interesting than I thought. And I I like being challenged by you guys. So I'm I'm excited about this show from that standpoint, because I think this is going to be one of those kind of conversation starters for a lot of people. Yeah, I think this is great as we're kind of coming into the tail end here of the Summer Sector Series. But you know, in each one of these, in our conversations beforehand and just doing the research required to be ready for these shows, I feel like I've learned a ton, quite honestly, myself. It's, it's been a little bit of summer school for me, more than I, than I anticipated coming into this. Happy to be, happy to be uh, your mentor, Dan, life, <laughs> life coach in, in this space. Just really happy to be here for you. Yeah, I didn't properly credit that. I was going to say I've learned so much from Seth this summer and getting prepared for this, but, you know. As always, Ben, giving yourself way too much credit. Dan, Um, Dan, summer school just must be so easy and normal for you. It's okay. It's okay. (laughs) There was a couple extra summers and winter sessions along the way, but. (laughs) Yeah, where do we go, you guys? Uh, Where does the time go? Because there it is. We're getting close to a wrap on the summer sector series, which means kids, those kids, they're going to be going back to school. We've got a little bit about that for you guys today as well. And with that, we have a show for you that if you haven't picked up, (laughs) it could be a total snooze fest. If you were to probably pick this up off somebody's coffee table, you probably, you would be a very rare person if you grabbed what we're about to talk about and said, oh yeah, let me learn more about that today. But the truth is, it is. We're going to get into it in some ways that you are, are going to really learn a lot, and it's going to be fun. I promise, I promise, I promise. You don't want to go anywhere. But with that, it is building blocks of the economy, and we're going to be talking about the materials sector. I know you guys have been waiting all summer long. Like, oh, when are they going to talk about materials sector? When? Please, let them be talking about the materials sector this next week. I just can't wait another week to hear about it. So, it is with great pleasure and anticipation that we bring you the materials sector. Yes, one of the 11 sectors of the S&P 500. I feel like we should, it's a good time for us to have a sponsor step in and do some kind of a little outtake or something like that. But they probably, no, I don't have any sponsors here. Just just us, just Ben, Dan, <laughs> Seth, sponsoring the show for you today. So with that, we get to continue to go through the rest of the show without boring the heck out of you. Did you guys have something other than just your normal wit and candor that I love so much about you to add to this uh, are you intro. Are you saying you want to know if we have anything valuable to actually add to the conversation, I, Seth? Is I know you asking? don't really, I know you don't have anything valuable at this point. I, I can bring so value, that's not what Seth. I'm asking. I can bring value. <laughs> Separate from Dan's 12 months a year of schooling that he uh, he enjoyed. <laughs> Annually. Um, now, the material sector is incredible. I mean, it's one of the most cyclical sectors out there. You know, if you're really into predictive uh, investing, it potentially could be a big player in that space. I really think that we have underestimated the relevance and the importance of the material sector in so many spaces. Like, for instance, just the, the idea of how much copper, aluminum, gold, you know, platinum is used in infrastructure for semiconductor chips. 
all of the stuff that drives all of our infrastructure is incredible. But separate from that, you have chemicals and wood and steel. I mean, there's different, all sorts of different things that are inside the material sector that drive unbelievable conversation about, hey, listen, if all of a sudden something happens, you know, hey, you know, interest rates start dropping. Guess what? Material sector starts taking off. And that's a real great opportunity for people to really look at, you know, where do we want to be? And we're going to talk a little bit about the COVID crisis and how, you know, the cost of lumber scaled way down and then quintupled and like just massive changes in materials and how it is literally the the author of the economic change in our world. You know, as as the economy changes in front of us, the material sector lives and dies and breathes off of what's going on in our economy. I think that conversation is a really healthy conversation to understand all the other sectors, which is why I think this is such a great piece to add to our conversation in the sector series is, you know, where is materials just literally the building blocks, as you had said, Seth, in our title, to everything else out there. And if you don't understand how that is going to morph into the other investments that you're so dependent on on a daily basis that you know the names of, we're going to educate you today in a way that you can really ride the economy better. And I'm excited about that. You said it. We, 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 we've got to get going because it's uh, it's going to be a show that's going to have a ton of information. We have to spend a little bit of time with this bit right here. Hey, if you are listening to this for the first time, welcome. And you can find us if you're on the radio with us today. You can find us in in, a, in podcast form. You can just go to any podcast venue, look up Money on Tap. We thank you for doing that and subscribing or leaving us a comment or stars or any of that stuff helps us out to just get money on tap to more people, builds notoriety within the podcast communities. If you're in that podcast community already, um, one of the things we want to ask you to do is send us an email at info at your money on tap dot com, letting us know, hey, I'm here. Love to hear from you. And with that, we'll send you some money on tap gear. That's really that's the offer that I have for you if there is. Is any offer? We want to make sure that you're getting recognized, and we appreciate you guys in that space with us. It's time for money in the news. First article today coming to us from the New York Post by Taylor Henslick. Here's how much more you can expect to spend on back to school shopping amid sticky inflation. And this is kind of a, a seasonal read. I mean, this comes up almost every year as we get prepared for these shows about this time, because it is that time, you know, it's time to get ready to get the kids back to school. And as inflation has been a persistent issue in our lives, in our economy and in everything we do for the last couple of years, it of course is having an effect on the back to school supply world. Uh, People are anticipating about a 6% increase with a national average up from 315 last year, $315 for all the back to school supplies up to 333 this year. And I can add just a little bit of personal flavor. I just got a text from my wife on the way back from Target at lunch, and our back-to-school haul was $430. So a little little extra hyperinflation in my house, but uh, I get a feeling that wasn't tightly adhered to on the list of, of things we need. So it's possi- I would check the receipt and make sure everything was purchased for the children, Dan. Yes, there's possibly a little bit of leakage in there. Something else is going on, but um, <laughs> anyway – uh, it is something that's going to hit families across the country this year, no doubt. Uh, like with the many other things, prices are going up. It's hard enough for kids going to school, you know, maybe not having like, you know, a couple pairs of pants or this, the different change of clothes, all the different things that happen with kids in, in school and the emotional, like who's got the latest this, that, and the other thing. It's causing parents to have to, you know, really make choices. And I think, honestly, those aren't necessarily bad things for kids to have to face in today's day and age. I mean, you know, if you have to... You have to stretch a little bit and maybe not buy the uh, the coolest blouse or the coolest pair of jeans or whatever. You know, it teaches it teaches a lot among kids, but it, it does require the parents to you know kind of step into that void and say no. Um, and I know we've had that conversation at the house and just kind of like dealing with it. You know, I have four kids; like it's it's definitely an expensive story each and every year. And my wife is always looking for bargains and opportunities and hey you know she's looking all summer long for little stuff and 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 so forth so i think for the shopping world it takes a lot more work to reduce the inflationary impact that this article points to 
but you guys know I'm not happy with this administration and what's happened with inflation during its time. And I feel like there's just so many things that could have been done and been dealt with differently. I think the Fed, you know, at this point in time should have lowered rates. There's just a thousand different things, right? It doesn't help us if you if the Fed keeps raising rates and you got to replace your car. So your car loan is 10 times higher. So you can't buy any clothes at all. I mean, it's just the whole thing is just ridiculous. We should be in a much better financial situation as a country than what's going on right now. So I will say this. It was uh, it was a bit of a relief and a surprise. We had a uh, friend that works at Nike gift us with a Nike employee store pass. So I know you guys probably don't have but you guys have a, have like L.L. Bean. I'm trying to think of like, you, you know what I'm talking about. Who's, like Nike? There. Who's Nike? Who's Nike? Oh, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so there's this little little company called Nike over here. Employees get to go to the store and they get like half off basically of all this Nike gear. So they give out passes every once in a while. Got to go. Uh, I will say that even with a half off, the bill came to a fair amount more than the average here or what you, your haul was at Target. <laughs> and I will also say that um, I think mom and dad came away with some new school uh, new new school clothes <laughs> this year too. <laughs> well, here we go. Buffett, 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 Buffett. I love Buffett. Buffett's Apple share dump is set to reshape major stock gauges. Yahoo Finance, Lu Wang, and Yakin Shen uh, bring us this article from Yahoo Finance. Actually, this was Bloomberg. Pardon me. And Warden Buffett's sudden sale of huge pile of Apple shares has come with a surprise and silver lining for investors in the iPhone maker. Its influence in major stock indexes is set to be fully in unleashed. So Apple is has been the story inside of Warren Buffett's portfolio. For one, Buffett, go back years wouldn't even touch technology. His reasoning, I don't understand it. I don't invest in what I don't understand. And then when he takes a stance or he takes a, a step into Apple, it becomes the majority of Buffett's holdings. So completely flip-flopped. And then now here we are, he's taking profits and I assume taking profits in Apple. It's only what I can imagine that he's doing, but it doesn't cite what those are here in the article. But it is, uh, it's such a massive position that it's going to be felt throughout our market. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, oh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I was okay. just going to say, it isn't referenced in the article, so I'd look it up elsewhere. But uh, the total of what he's sold so far is about half of his position, and it's $90 billion worth of Apple, which is an absolutely incredible amount. But the interesting thing, I think, you know, in the article is, is not so much, you know, Berkshire's approach to this and, and the reasons behind Buffett choosing to sell, and that's not really hit upon here, but the effect that it's going to have on the rest of you know, tech indexes and, and the, the different ETFs and mutual funds out there because they have a, a system of weighting and balancing each position within the index. And what was unknown to me is the fact that you know, Berkshire Hathaway holds these stocks for so long and they have this reputation of buy and hold that the, the volume that they have of Apple has actually been excluded from what's considered to be the float, which in our terminology is, is just another way of saying all of these shares that are available for purchase. So typically when we talk about float, that would include all of the common stock shares that are out there that the company is not holding them themselves. Usually companies hold back a little bit of their stock and, and that's really not in the market. But because of Buffett's reputation and his history of doing this, They've actually excluded his position from the float as well inside of these index weighting calculations, which was, I was totally unaware of. I mean, he's got these shares he could sell them anytime he wants, and, and that's what he's chosen to do. But the effect it's going to have is going to be wide felt. Yeah, this is really very interesting. I, I honestly didn't know about this weighting glitch inside this and probably shouldn't be realized. It's just based on his trading history that they're, that they're evaluating what the float is, Dan. Adjusting like, it just for him, essentially, is the way I'm yeah, reading. Yeah, I mean, I, maybe I should be more aware of this, but I mean, why would we, you know, like, hey, if I have a, a history of holding stocks for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, I don't think the S&P and, and whatever indice is going to evaluate my 
standard trend as a reason to change the auspices of how they invest. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. I'm really curious what's going to happen to the stock. This literally could send a day of Apple stock into skyrocket mode, um, which is really interesting. So, you know, if you own Apple and it just happens to go up some massive amount one day, then sell it. <laughs> I would just say this change. I'm curious, Dan, what the indices are going to be because these fund managers know this and they're not stupid. How many of them are recalibrating now prior to that change? I mean, just looking at the the Apple swing, you know, the high being 237 and it go, dropping all the way down into, you know, 190s and then, it's, you know, pulling back up into the 216, 218. Like, I mean, this stock is moving all over the place right now. And I think there's probably some internal adjustments that are going on. But I'm just wondering how fundamentally based a lot of these index, index trading programs are that they're maybe not allowed to do that. Another interesting tidbit that was kind of at the end of the article, kind of just a, barely a mention, but – you know, they point out the fact that there are there are traders out there that simply sit around and they trade around, you know, index mutual fund and ETF rebalances. You know, so yeah. for guys like that, which I, you know, I was aware of that strategy, it kind of makes sense, but I didn't know people were literally that is the theme on which they trade. But this article points out to that fact. You know, this is going to be the biggest day they've ever seen. These guys are going to be going absolutely crazy for Apple when this rebalance happens because you've never seen, I've never seen a ninety billion dollar correction across every tech packaged instrument in the investment world. I mean, this is going to be big. Yeah, this is. I think this is going to be one of those conversations we're going to see on CNBC. Apple closed at an astronomical high, up 15%. You know, it'll be, and, and, and they'll be educating us at that point on what's going on. So just curious. It should be end of the quarter, but I, it, you know, it depends on when, when these different companies set up their rebalancing programs. I mean, every fundamental system – has its own little quirks. So, you know, this could be a one day event or this could be a week long event or two week long event. Be curious to see. Yeah. The the really sage fund managers should be out there doing it now. We should be scooping them up before the the rest of the market hits this adjustment. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just a a little bit of what that kind of is going to be like inside, inside the size, it's going to be triple the average daily trading volume of the company's shares over the past month. Just, a flavor for you guys. It's going to be, and these are market. Be, these are market orders. These aren't like yeah. limit orders. These are fill, 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 fill. <laughs> it's going to yeah. go up the ladder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys. We uh, are going to keep moving here today with you. Thanks for joining us at Money on Tap. And today we get to get into some of the unsung heroes of the S and P five hundred. Uh, this is the. Uh, building blocks of the economy. It's the material sector show for you here at Money on Tap. Thank you for going and subscribing to Money on Tap. Thank you for joining us here today. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey everyone, Dan Mikulon here with Brayshaw Financial. Looking for a hassle-free way to invest? Look no further than Brayshaw Financial Group. With Brayshaw Financial Group, you can start investing with as little as $100, enjoy a user-friendly platform with a diverse range of investment options. Visit Brayshaw Financial Group and start your investment journey today. Brayshaw Financial Group, investing made easy. Thank you for joining us for Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more of this week's show with Ben, Seth, and Dan. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. And uh, we are diving into or building with the blocks of an economy. We're talking about the materials sector today. And as we are in this, what, 10th of the 11th sectors of the S&P 500 as we're going through our summer sector series with you guys, this is uh, a very interesting sector for us. Uh, For one, we're not talking about tech, right? 
we're we're going into some very foundational economic plays, like the ebbs and the flows of the economy. Um, it, what we've been building our market off of and what we've been building economies off of for as long as we have data on it. When I mean, we're talking about the commodities, we're talking about precious metals, gases, manufacturing, raw materials, mining or copper. That's where we're at. Forest products. That's where we're at inside of today's show with you guys. So as we, you know, have some fun with this and hopefully give you an opportunity to get a lens on something that you probably don't take. Well, yeah, you probably don't take a close look at this in your investment portfolio, but it's going to be tucked in there somewhere, at least for periods of for windows. And you're going to discover why we say that. You know, I think it's really very interesting. You joked around about, you know, we, we call this the summer sector series. We're talking, we joking around earlier about summer school and, you know, just school in general. And I really equate the material sector to kind of like the math class you have to take, the algebra, the, you know, the, the thing that you know you're going to need, the thing you know you're going to be using in life, but you really don't want to have to do the work, right? I mean, like, you know, but when you look at like, you know, when you look at some of these performances inside the material over the last, you know, years and so forth, some of these holdings are, have done absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, just the X ETF, ETF, one of them out there, it's up 62% in five years. I mean, it's had a massive run. I mean, some of these material stocks have skyrocketed and we don't talk about it because it's like, Hey, listen, you know, you're going to go get that job after high school or college. And, and, and you know, you're going to be using math. You know, somebody's going to ask you, you're going to have to do it. When it comes to the material sector, it's very much like it's the thing we need, but boy, we really don't want to talk about it. Like no one wants to talk about the lumber prices or, you know, you know, Dow chemical or, you know, uh, you know, mining, you know, mining organizations in Brazil and Russia that, you know, are, you know, the biggest platinum, I think it's platinum, right, Dan, or mm -hmm. it's palladium. I'm not sure, but they're like the, they're like the local, those are the global geographic regions for those, that resource. And, you know, they, who wants to think about that in the middle of a Russian Ukraine war? Do we need that metal? Is that going to be a problem? You know, the, these are not the, these are not, this is not the algebra class anyone wants to take again. And so <clears throat> we joked around about this, but honestly, the material sector with what's going on in our economy and what's happening politically, uh, the development of EV cars, the precious metal space, the demand for energy, like you're finding coal in here. I mean, there's just, there's just a lot of stuff going on that honestly really runs at the base of everything in our world. And I think, I think this conversation, I actually think the material sector is tremendously interesting. So we were joking around about it, but it is an area that we don't get a lot of it to in conversations You're on CNBC or you read the wall street journal, you know, there's not a lot going on in the materials world, right? Nobody's talking about it. This is like, uh, I think that movie trading places, you know, with uh, Eddie Murphy, right? Was it? And uh, you know, they're trading stocks, and they're like buying orange commodity futures. You know, like it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's nobody cares. Like that's not the conversation of every day. It's not the big wow. Look at what Nvidia is doing. This chip can do all this AI stuff. Nobody talks about the basics that we build off of. And I think you know these building blocks are something that's going to drive a lot more as we continue to progress as a technological society. It's going to continue to progress as we see, and we, you know, we back to the energy conversation we had a few weeks ago, you know, India is going, you know, as they build their middle class, India is using one barrel of oil a day, a, per, a, a year per person. And Americans use 25 barrels a year per person. And India is going to one and a half as they continue uh, barrels a day, I'm sorry, day, I keep saying day, one and a half barrels a year. That's a 50% increase per person per year. And that's as they build their middle class. Well, those middle class people are going to start having more computers and more cell phones and, and, you know, air conditioners. And that was one of his examples, you know, 
I think about that need, but all the metals involved in all that stuff, all the 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 lumber, the material, the you name it, the energy demand, that all the chips you have to do for building all that out. Like these basic materials are the demand is growing rapidly as the oil goes. It's it's kind of like pulling the carriage behind the horse. Right. Everyone wants to run fast. But you, if you want to be on the horse and more than you know, a couple people, well, you got to have a carriage. So now you so these materials are being dragged across the demand and the energy is used to produce it. The energy is used to utilize those events. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting what materials are going to do for us. Yeah, I think it's it is interesting. And, and basic materials, the sector involves you know, the discovery, the extraction, the processing, the manufacturing of natural resources. Right, so they're taking things, materials that are found here on this earth, and and you know, putting them into the the shape and the phase and, and the material structure that we then need to build everything that we do, and and looking through the names of you know who's involved in this sector from an individual company perspective, individual stocks. We're joking about how it, it seems like it's kind of a boring lineup of names, and the more I was thinking about it, it's you know what the reason it, it feels kind of boring is that you, know, you never see any of these companies with a Super Bowl commercial, right? These aren't brands that we talk about, <laughs> right? These aren't things that you would walk into Target or Walmart and see on the shelf because they are very much in the business-to-business model, right? They're, they're providing the resources to the companies that actually build the products that we then go buy. So that those are the much more recognizable names to us because it's the finished product. It's what we see on the shelf. It's what we hear on the radio waves. It's what we see in TV commercials, but all of that is being sourced behind the scenes from these materials producers, right? They're doing the dirty work, the real raw stuff, digging it out of the ground, cleaning it off, and then selling it to somebody who then takes it, refines it, and puts it on the shop at the jewelry at the jewelry store, right? Puts it on the counter at the jewelry store. So, you know, they're the providers for what ultimately becomes, becomes the, the end use product that we all consume hand over fist in this country. But without this material sector providing what's required to do that, you know, we'd be in, in big trouble. But it's also what makes it probably amongst, if not the most cyclical sector, right? When times are good, when people are building, materials providers do well. When things get a little tighter, and this is driven by interest rates and geopolitics and all those other, all those other issues, but, you know, when the desire to build and to acquire and to expand lessens a little bit, the material sector is going to feel that. So it's very much cyclical and it's very much supply and demand based. So there's, there's two ongoing cycles that any investor really needs to keep in mind before you dive into this particular sector. It's, you know, what's the general health of the economy, including interest rates and things like that. And generally speaking, and, and if you're trying to invest in any given material, specific material now, gold, silver, palladium, platinum, lumber, coal, you know, what does supply and demand look like for that particular product at this moment in time? Yeah, there's um, the overall, right, the macro and then getting into the micro there. And, and as you're uh, talking about the, the investments inside of the sector, it really is a good old boys club. You know, like you said, it's not going to be the Super Bowl commercial. It's the chemical company. It's the people behind the scenes and you play palladium. Right. I think this is getting more in the micro here. How often is it that you're looking at a palladium play? Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, not very well known, or at least not as well known as like your gold and silver and platinum. Um, there's a very limited number of mines in the world. So that supply and demand story really has a lot more gravitas here, you know, and unless you're really looking back at what 2021, where it was an all time high because cattle. <laughs> This is what drives this is is hilarious to me. The catalytic converter theft skyrocketed when <laughs> these were trying to get their hands on your, on the palladium. Um, didn't see that one coming, did you? You know like that's that was, crazy, isn't it? I mean, people were stealing catalytic converters just to get the palladium that's used to make them. Which yeah. I, I mean, it's incredible because we all talk about platinum. And being this, you know, strongest metal or whatever, but palladium's like I think I read twelve or thirteen percent stronger than platinum, which is really interesting. But I'm not stealing any yeah. catalytic converters myself, so I'm leaving that alone. <laughs> yeah, I mean it covers a lot of bases. There's the like like the, because of the strength of it, it's going into dental fillings and crowns and um, 
yeah, so there's a lot there's a lot more wider use for these materials than you know at first blush. So it's it's the uh, it's the macro story, but then there's a lot of different stories inside of this too. So if you're investing in you know the kind of these commodities in these sectors, you're you are really paying attention to some storylines and understanding you know the world in a lot different you know a, a different way than probably your average investor would. And so it's uh, it's cool to be able to take, that's what's the fun stuff in this, right? Is we get to tell some different stories and it's not the AI story today or the, um, oh, you know, self-driving car story today. So we're getting into some of that with you. you Got to take a quick break. You are listening to Money on Tap and we're covering the building blocks of an economy, the material sector with you today. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Thank you so much for subscribing to the podcast. When you do that, yes, drop us a line. Let us know because we want to send you out some Money on Tap gear. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hey, guys. Seth Crossman with Brayshaw Financial Group. Are you ready to take control of your financial future? Look no further than Brayshaw Financial Group. Our team of experienced advisors is dedicated to helping beginners like you build wealth through smart investing strategies. Visit BrayshawFinancial.com today and start your journey towards financial independence. Brayshaw Financial Group, your partner in wealth creation. We appreciate you listening to Money on Tap with Ben, Seth, and Dan. You can contact us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more of this week's program. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. And if you're just joining in, uh, we are talking about the building blocks of the economy. That's the material sector. And there's, you know what, there's just so much to cover each one of these. Every time we kind of start unpacking a sector, it's like, oh, my gosh. And then there's more. And then there's this. And then it's and that's the fun part of it, too, is because we get into discovery and we get to. Uh, we get to have fun learning alongside of you a lot of the times. And when we're talking about, you know, what are some of the levers on behind this sector? You know, the push and the pull, the economy. This is a sector that typically gets driven a lot by an expanding economy because inside of materials, there's those like copper would be one. Lumber would be another part of this as well that, the expanding economy story says, hey, we're using more of this material, driving this sector forward. And so there's that economic sensitivity inside of this sector. And as well, Ben, you were just saying, you know, um, it, it, it's not always that way inside of the sector because there's the precious metals where you have silver, gold, platinum. And those are traditionally used as a hedge and what do we inside of a portfolio complete? I'll try to complete that thought, not leave you hanging. A hedge inside of a portfolio is where you have an investment inside of a portfolio so that when the economy is not doing so well or the stock market isn't doing so well, you have something inside of that that's going to help continue to keep your portfolio afloat. And that is going to, that is really truly diversification inside of a portfolio so that not everything is going the same direction at the same time so there's even parts there's diversification inside of this sector as well which is a really cool factor that you don't have all the time inside of a sector yeah i think it is interesting in the way that it's it's sensitive but it's it's not correlated you know there there are different factors that impact it and i think uh you know the the pandemic was was a great illustration of this you know obviously we We've talked at length about supply chain issues, supply and demand in general, how that worked globally when the ships stopped moving and the you know, manufacturing outlets were, were closed. But lumber is a, is a prime example of that. And for anybody that was trying to build anything early on in that, that phase of life, uh, you felt this very painfully, I'm sure. But uh, you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic, 
when everything was shut down and no one knew which way to turn here, the price of lumber dropped about 40%, just right off the bat, took a pretty steep dive. But uh, soon into the pandemic, when every figure, everyone figured out, hey, we're going to be at home and we might as well improve our home or add to our home or wouldn't it be nice to have a little something out back that we could run to? You know, the, the price of lumber absolutely skyrocketed. We're talking about a 550% increase in a very, very contracted period of time. So if you were, you know, at the mercy of a contractor during those days, you know, we feel for you. But, you know, as, as is such with supply and demand, you know, as soon as the world kind of opened back up and, and lumber was able to be shipped and was readily available again, the price dropped from there 80% from that 550% climb all the way back down to right about where it was pre-pandemic. You know, so the value of a of a beam is what it is, and and you know when it's available, it's not overly expensive. But when things get tight, you know that's just a prime example of supply and supply and demand really working against you. Yeah, I remember during that time period, I would talk to builders, and they would be like, "Yeah, we can't even give you a price on materials. We just do this is our cost to do build the house, and this whatever the material cost is, we mark it up ten or fifteen or twenty percent. You know, like, and that number's unknown. So." It was just, it was crazy. I would talk to you. I'm like, that's, that's literally nuts. But everyone was trying to build something at their house. And, and the only people that could work were the trades. Like, I mean, that was like, everyone else was locked up at home. And it's like, well, if you're, if you're, you know, uh, you know, what, what was it? A, a necessity? We were deemed essential, Ben. We were deemed, deemed essential. essential. Yes. Essential, which I always joked around about really just meant like you're expendable. So the guy at the <laughs> grocery store packing your bags, he was essential. But the doctor that in my neighborhood that we would go on walks for with during COVID was not essential. He, <laughs> he said he went on, it was on the sixth walk for the day. He's like, hey, I can't go in. I'm not essential. <laughs> I was like, all that schooling we poured into you, you're not an essential person. No, it's just, it just great terminology for expendable. <laughs> so, um, but uh, yeah, that COVID period was, it was pretty incredible. And it was, it was probably like, it was like the light bulb being turned on in a dark room for, you know, after being a night of sleep, you're like, wow, it's bright. It's like, it's just glaring how much the, the material sector just skyrocketed through that time period. And yeah, it, it did. It came back down to, to where it was before. Um, so building is becoming more you know palatable though. I would tell you that, you know, Builders are not really lowering their prices as quickly as everything else. Everything's still really expensive to build, but the materials are back to where they were. It's kind of funny. But, you know, as we talk about these various building blocks of our economy, as we, we talk about that, you know, we get into the, the precious metals piece. And I think this is one of the areas where we all hear rumor and we talk about the various metals, gold, silver, you know, platinum, palladium, there's, you know, Various uses for each one of these. It's amazing what, um, you know, you think about the creation of, of gold and how, you know, God talks about, you know, the streets of gold in heaven, but, you know, gold doesn't tarnish. You know, it's, I think that's really very interesting. You know, it's like, yeah, hey, it doesn't oxidize. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting metal. I, mean, I like that's probably a whole story in its own, but I think it's probably one of the most incredible metals in the idea that God used it for the streets of gold because, hey, great, it's not going to tarnish. We don't, no one's got to clean it. <laughs> so, um, though that would might be my position in heaven. I was, so, I was like, is that is, is there some theology in that? Did, I've never I, really pulled the etymology in that. It just came to my that. head. I was like, wow, you know what? The streets of gold are they're not going to tarnish. So, um, it's, it's kind of interesting. But you know, it, it, we, we talk about metals and the demand for metals as technology advances. With about 8 billion people or whatever it is we have in this world. And, and I think, you know, that comment Fred Gratz made was, I thought, just really right on target. A couple of shows ago when he said, you know, we're 4% of the world's economy. You know, like we're 4% of the world, right, as Americans. And everyone wants to be America. Everyone wants to have what America has. Well, guess what we have? Technology, technology, technology. I mean, we got phones, iPads, computers, lights, you know, I mean, my family and I, we went to Guatemala on a missions trip a number of years ago, and I wanted my kids to see it. I'd been there before, and I just wanted them to see Third World. Well, we crossed this river that had a walking bridge only. There was only two vehicles on the other side on this kind of, like, deserted portion of Guatemala. And these people, 
they had so, a solar panel, you know, a little TV and a, and a cell phone. That's it. But they lived in a shack in a hut with dirt floors. Like it was as primitive as it gets, but they want everything we have. Like those are things they wanted those things. So somebody carried those things across the mountain, probably on their back and created a little hut. It's like, but they were the wealthy family. And so you think about it, everyone wants to be America. So the demand for these metals is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow. And and honestly, some of these copper mines are getting depleted. The quality of the copper that's coming out of some of these mines that they've had in Brazil, I was you know reading about that. You know the the quality is not as good. They they've got to get more of it and refine it, which takes more work, costs more, etc. Just a lot of things going on. And, and when I think of the material space, yeah, we talk about lumber, we talk about steel, we talk about chemicals, and we can have a whole conversation on that. But I think the area that is going to expand personally over the next, you know, 20 years as everyone in the world tries to become America, the demand for, you know, literally these hard metals is going to be astronomical. There's only so much of it. It's like it's truly a supply and demand. We're we're going to have to pull it out of the earth or recycle or find something else. So there's a hard part of this that is uh really truly is a supply and demand piece there on the gold, silver, and precious metals. And I think that's also one of the reasons that we get into these hedges uh, that we were talking about before is it's one of the, one of the places that understand we're not, we're going to say safe haven, ha- safe haven asset, meaning it's, um, it's a flight to safety in terms of where the market will go when everything else is going haywire. It is. It is really a flight to safety in the, in the sense that, you know, the, the value of these materials themselves doesn't really depreciate all that often. And the need for them, although it ebbs and flows with the global economy, there's always some underlying need. Right. So these 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 companies stay in business. But the trick from an investment perspective and and how these companies operate is that it's it's one very, very labor and, and capital extensive. It's very expensive to open a mine and actually dig the stuff out of the earth. So they have a Do you know that because you have one, Dan, or? Uh, I've thought about running off to a mine several times, but um, <laughs> watching my kids play Minecraft for a few hours has convinced me that I do not want to do that. Is it, are your children <laughs> like mining for diamonds, Dan? Do we need a- uh, Obsidian, I think, is what they mine for. Is, um, <laughs> I think that's their favorite. But um, yeah, watching them play is, is torture in itself, but then watching them watch YouTubers play is a special kind of hell that I wish to never, never experience again. So I'm kind of like. <laughs> Thank you. Tuned off the mining thing <laughs> completely after a few hours of that. But, um, you know, so. Can I just can I say one thing? Isn't it ironic that we talk about all these children who are mining really like in Africa for diamonds and hard metals and how horrible it is. But yet in America, like the top game is Minecraft, where we pretend to be mining for diamonds and gold and metals. <laughs> I think that is irony and its finest. But go ahead, Dan. Sorry. Yeah, that, that's a deep statement on humanity there. I don't think we can we can unpack that one here today. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the trick for turning a profit in, for these companies is is that it's very expensive to do. Right, it takes a lot of investment to, you know, first of all, discover where these deposits are, and then acquire all the machinery and the manpower and everything that's involved in extracting it. It's extremely dirty work, so they have all kinds of regulatory issues as we get more and more sensitive to carbon footprints and the byproducts of the mining and and what do you do with all this waste? And you know, from there, you know, after they've been through the expense of digging it out and and refining it and getting it ready for market. Then they enter into what's a fluctuating price situation on a regular basis dependent upon all the things we spoke to before, just the, the cyclical issues that they face on the global economy and regulation and interest rates and all those things that affect all of us. So from an investment perspective, it is, it is that hedge. It is that flight to safety. It, it does tend to hold its value. And you know that, that's separate from actually acquiring the metals themselves. We're talking about investing in companies that do this work. Uh, that it, it is a good place to run when things get tight, but it's also very, very expensive for these companies to operate. And so that growth potential is at times limited, although when we took a look at the you know, five-year performance of some of these leading, leading investment products in the ETF space particularly, you know, the returns have been very, very strong. So it is a, it is a complicated story, but it is a place that does serve as a non-correlated hedge in a lot of ways to the rest of the investment world. 
you're listening to Money on Tap, you can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We are building blocks of the economy with you today in the materials sector. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Are you looking for personalized guidance to kickstart your investing journey? Look no further. Brayshaw Financial Group and our planners are here to help. Our team of experts will provide personalized advice tailored to your financial goals. Visit BrayshawFinancial.com today to schedule your free consultation. Brayshaw Financial, investing made easy. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more Money on Tap with Ben, Seth, and Dan. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We are building blocks of the economy with you today as we uh, get through, get through, dig through, build through the material sector with you. Uh, so many different ways to to go inside of this space as far as an investor. Um, you know, there's there's a lot to it. If you haven't learned that so far today, then... <laughs> You know, we're we're all in it together. You know, we're we're all in it together when it comes down to the material sector. And and there's something that we're going to uncover here, and something that's new for you. By the way, thank you for subscribing to Money on Tap, and also thank you for sending us uh, in, at info at yourmoneyontap dot com a message, just letting us know we want to send you some Money on Tap gear. As far as what are some of the opportunities that you have, some of the in, the companies that we take a look at that are predominant or the, the headliners of this industry. Uh, we want to get there with you, but before we do that, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, copper and the story. I mean, this is a big player inside of this space. You know, I think, I think the one thing a lot of people don't realize is how much copper we use. And I, I think probably the best illustration, you know, we were talking about it before the show and I was just kind of remarking on it over and over again, because I look at EV cars and, I mean, <clears throat> when you look at it, an EV car driving down the road, it uses four times the amount of copper that a regular car uses. I mean, think about the wiring and the harnesses and the mechanic, like all the different parts in there that they use copper for <laughs> in cars. And at four times, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think about the amount of mining that goes on. You know, if you, if you don't like mining and big, you know, diesel trucks running and, you know, you know, diesel blowing up in the air like that's four times as much to get an ev car on the road because the whole concept about ev you know is all about the the environment everyone feels good when you get in a nice clean ev you don't realize you know the the creating of the lithium batteries can't be done in the united states because it, it causes too much pollution so we ship the material to india and then they they refine it and then they send it back to us we create a battery that's going to last a very short period of time and that when we're done with it is a massive pollutant. And then we don't think about all the different mining vehicles that burn tons of, you know, diesel and so forth. And yet we need four times as much to create this EV car. So you feel good, but then you plug this car in and you need to use oil over 98% or 97% of the time to power it to a hundred percent or coal or whatever you're powering it, you know, whatever your power plant's doing. Cause you know, the vast majority of people aren't solar independent we don't realize in all of our good intentions how much we're doing and, and to think that just an EV car is 4X. Now, whether you're on the EV ch- train or you're not, most people are. And so that's why the demand is so good. That's why Tesla's a skyrocketing company. Like people want that feeling of I'm doing something good for the environment. So, hey, copper demand's going to go up. Chip demand's going to go up. You think about all the different pieces, silver, I mean, all everything. The demand for this stuff is skyrocketing each and every day with almost every new innovation. And I think the point I'm making is, is that EV cars are here to stay. There's a massive push for them, but yet the demand for materials is actually more 
in these kind of raw elements that are demanded for all these other industries. So high demand, high prices, something to think about. You know, copper is just one of the kind of precious metals that, that fall into the sector, but there's a number of other things that, that get produced that the future looks pretty good about. You know, when it comes to you know, mining and metal, you know, Alcoa is a company, the ticker symbol is AA. They make aluminum and all kinds of different aluminum products, which is vastly expanding material used in all kinds of construction. Freeport McMoran, the ticker for that is FCX. They're the major player in the copper space, but they also mine for gold and silver and other precious metals. So if, if this metals thing is something you want to get behind, you know, there's a couple names to consider. And when it comes to construction materials, Semex, which as it might, you know, might be obvious, they make cement. And they're, they're one of the leading producers <laughs> for that in the U.S. And um, you know, we obviously pour tons of cement and, and building of these factories and you know, the desire to bring manufacturing back into the U.S., which I think is a great idea. And we would think about the focus around chips and electronics for that. But we've got to build those factories first. And what yeah. are those factories going to take? A ton of copper, a ton of aluminum, and literally tons upon tons upon tons of cement, right? That, that's where it's all going to start. This company's like Vulcan. Ticker symbol for that is VMC. And they do work with uh, crushed stone, sand, gravel, all those kind of products. So you, you see that in use all over the world constantly. And then the, the kind of a, a little disgust, and we haven't even gotten into it, sector of the basic – basic materials sector is packaging. There are companies that just make packaging to ship food products around. We're talking about cardboard and plastic containers and those kinds of things. But because they produce packaging, they're considered a basic material. And that's a, you know, obviously in the, the world of Amazon and instant delivery, well, we all know how much cardboard and waste and, and just stuff gets involved with delivering that to your doorstep immediately. And there's companies like Amcor, PLC, Ticker symbol that is for AMCR and Ball Corporation, B-A-L-L, that specifically work in glass packaging. So there's there's lots of very interesting stuff out there that is kind of flying beneath the radar because, you know, they're wholesale materials for the retailers we buy from. But this is all the stuff that those companies need to get us from A to B and get those goods in our hands. You know, some of the other factors that are driving this sector as well that don't get a whole lot of attention, like you were saying, packaging. Well, the healthcare sector can drive a lot of materials, just all of those pieces that are getting used inside of there as well. Um, You know, food, like you mentioned, power generation, all these things are factors inside of this. And one of the things I really do like around the materials in general is they can have some pretty reliable cash flow. And we do, you know, we recognize the ebbs and the flows of the expansion and contraction of an economy being there. But these are, generally speaking, these are going to be pieces of our economy that are going to stick around. These companies are generally creating uh, pretty healthy dividends a lot of the time, too. So it is a space where if you are a value or a dividend and an income kind of an investor, you can find some really great buys inside of this. Yeah. I think one of the things about the investing in this sector is is that you can't really get too granular. You can get really dangerous because you don't know if a mine's running empty, if you know those types of things are happening. I really encourage people, if you want to get into the material sector, ETFs really seem to be the best play. If you want to get into gold, you can actually buy a gold ETF. If you want to just get into a, press, a, a metals or, I'm sorry, materials ETF, you can buy a materials ETF and get, you know, chemicals and, you know, precious metals and all the different pieces, steel and, you know, wood and whatever. Those are the types of things you can do through ETFs. I think it's a much safer play if you want that kind of exposure. But I hope this show really helped. That's going to do it for us Money on Tap. And thank you for joining us for the building blocks of the economy in the material sector with us today. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for investing in yourself. Thank you for being here today and be successful in your investing. We'll see you next week. All season long, it's Money on Tap's Summer Sector Series. Each week, exploring a different high growth industry, analyzing major players, market trends, and emerging opportunities. 
Join us again next week for more smart, sizzling investment opportunities here at Money on Tap. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through Osaic Wealth Incorporated member FINRA SIPC and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group LLC are independent of Osaic Wealth Incorporated. Osaic Wealth Incorporated and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire, 03110 and can be reached at toll-free 855-226-8551. Well, bye.